Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I am your host, Chris Doris, and every once in a while, we like to switch it up a little bit, and we're doing that this week. We've got another highlight reel for you where we go back into the archives and we, we select a handful or two handfuls of our amazing badass guests and we, uh, we, we pick out some nuggets of mental toughness gold and we put them together in a, in a highlight reel here for you. So we've got that for you today. Now, as a reminder, uh, if you're not getting the notifications of uh, the Tough Talks and blog posts and, and if you aren't getting your 6 a.m. daily dose, the daily dose, that's my morning email blast where I send out the daily dose of mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less, then we need to address that. Let's go ahead and just resolve that issue, if that's the case, by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S. ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists. Put your name and email and bam, we hook you up with all the goodies. All right, enjoy the reel. And as always, until next time, create miracles. As well, from the mental, the mental side of it, um, you know, one of the things, one of the things, one of the things that I did is I did extensive goal setting programs, mm. a goal setting program for the week, goal setting program for the month, goal setting program for the season, goal setting program, long term goal setting program. And when I failed, you know, one of the things that kept me going was I had this goal, you know, win an Olympic gold medal, be called the world's greatest athlete. It was sustained me, you know, but I didn't wasn't sure how deep goal setting could go. But, you know, one of the things we did was to be a champion in your mind. You gotta you 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 gotta believe it yourself first. And so, you know, I, I got the advice from somebody that said, look yourself in the mirror, call yourself the world's greatest athlete. And to do that, honestly, it's difficult at first. You know, I had to sit there, look myself in the mirror and say, You're the world's greatest athlete. You know, it doesn't make sense at first. Um, and, and you can't even do it at first, you know. Um, and so uh why, why, why do you think that is? You can't even do it at first. It's hard. Why? Why is that? Because I think when you're by yourself, you can be super honest, okay? And so many of us are programmed to believe if I can't do it in practice, I haven't put the time in yet, I, I need more reps. Um, and I think that as a young athlete, you're like, well, I haven't achieved that yet. I'm not to that status yet. And so that's the kind of thing that held me back. It's like, well, I haven't even won a world championship yet. I haven't even won a U.S. title yet, you know? So how can I call myself an Olympic champion? But over time, I practiced it and I gave it an honest effort where I would look at myself in the mirror every single night. You're the world's greatest athlete or you're the world champion or you're the world record holder. And it took months to get it going. But once I did, it really made a big difference. Now I went to bed a world champion. I woke up an Olympic gold medalist. I lifted weights as, a, as the world's greatest athlete, even though I hadn't achieved that stuff. Beautiful. And that was what really changed it for me because That's huge. I did that leading up to my first world title. And my coach would ask me about once a month, he's like, are you the world champion? And then he'd ask me in February and I'd go, eh. and then he'd ask me again in March. And by the time we got to June, I remember him asking me in July before an August world championship, are you the world champion? I looked at him straight and I said, yeah, I'm the world champion. I, I think my first one is life is good because it is. Uh, even when you think it's not, it's, it's a good life. And if you focus on the good, you know, and that's what I try to do. One of the things I tell people is on those tough, because we, we all have, I'd be lying if I said every day was easier. Every day I have a wonderful, yeah, it is a wonderful day, relatively speaking, compared to other days I've had, and I'm happy to be alive. But things happen. It's how you handle those really that defines who you are. And, and on the days, sometimes where there is just a funk, if you're just in a funk, whether you didn't sleep right or weather or the weather's bad or whatever it is, you still, you make the cho attitudes a choice. You make the decision to have a great day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that starts first thing in the morning. And so if it's like a tough, tough day and it sounds extremely corny, but taking a post-it note, something as simple as that and writing three to five things in your life that you're thankful for, you know, whether it's your son, daughter, wife, husband, uh, things that bring you joy, things that make you want to wake up in that morning and kick that day's butt. Hmm. You put that post-it note on your bathroom mirror and that's the first thing you see when you start your next day. 
And that positive thought in the morning sets the tone for your entire day. Elaborate upon for a second the, the, the phrase or term off-centered. Yeah, so that Emerson quote, while it's uh, inspiring, uh, it's too long to fit on the side of a six-pack. So we condense, we condense the sentiment to a single phrase, which is off-centered goodness for off-centered people. So it still includes that concept of goodness from the Emerson quote, but it more quickly gets to you know what we believe we're, we're making and generating as the dogfish brand and, who, and whom we're generating it for. Uh, so it's basically quickly letting folks know, hey, our beers, our, our spirits, our, our pub experiences are going to be in, intense, flavorful, you know, vivid. They're not going to be sort of, you know, uh, generic or, uh, you know, uh, sort of monochromatic. Mm. Um, so so it's, it's letting people know we're, we intentionally are going to stand outside the status quo. And maybe that means we aren't going to appeal to the majority of folks with what we do. Uh, like the light lager, you know, drinkers who just want not to be challenged by beer, uh, per, you know, they just want something, you know, super bland and, and, you know, poundable. And that's cool too, but that's not like the journey that we or the folks that, that, that choose to, to, to buy dogfish are on. So, yeah. So off-centered is non-generic. Yeah. Off-centered ales for off-centered people, off-centered goodness for off-centered people. It's yeah. About, being a nonconformist and uh, going on a journey together that's outside of sort of the, the, the status quo. Yeah, in startup land, most of us know we're making it up and trying shit and seeing if it works and adapting fast. And the more you do it, the more you're like, I think a little bit and I act a lot, right? You kind of lean that direction. I like that. I like but, that. But, I like uh, that. Like you know, that. just, just okay. enough. Right. And then go think a little bit. And I act a lot. That's nice. Yeah. I just made that up. So, Did you really? uh, but like, that's kind of normal for startups, like, like for people that are coming into the startup zone, first time startup owners, like this is going to be a mess and it's an experiment, but hurry up, you know, go. And uh, we'll see if you survive kind of thing. So, uh, but for big companies, it's almost like telling them the sun is the moon when you, play this mistakes are okay kind of thing right <laughs> no i mean we're human and there isn't bad and they're not bad people and so forth but the just the normal organizational momentum of a large organization is fewer mistakes yes you this is what happens at every company that grows up so careful what you ask for and it's the innovator's dilemma oh, wow. meaning the big companies can't make mistakes and throw stuff against the wall and keep throwing and keep throwing and keep throwing uh, by the way, it's also difficult for big companies to go all in on a new innovation. Which isn't that so interesting, right? The irony inherent with that, because all big companies weren't big at some point. Well, the ultimate irony is the crazy entrepreneur with all this experimentation and fast moving, you know, flexibility and all that kind of stuff to be successful, change the world, get millions of users and win a big prize. They actually have to build something that isn't able to experiment so much, right? <laughs> And try it. It's one of the most difficult things. Very, very, almost no companies are capable of it. Amazon and Google and Facebook are still pretty good at it, but most big companies are not good at innovation. How do you most profoundly want to use the rest of your life? And that's what you're doing right now, man. Yeah. I love so, that question. I've heard it from you multiple times. Um, but I feel like you don't understand that question until you pull yourself out of the matrix, until you're Neo. <laughs> you pull yourself out of the matrix. Yeah. I mean, listen, not everyone wants to be pulled out of the matrix. You've seen the movie. Some dudes yeah. want to be plug it I'll back in. This is hard. This is different. This is uncomfortable. That's why in my podcast, I talk about self-esteem so much. That if you don't like yourself, it, it, and I've been interviewed on this on leadership, if we don't have leaders with high self-esteem, it's really hard to develop them because they don't want, they can never get over that, that voice of, of I'm not good enough. And I can't take the risks and I need to stay in the bubble. I need to stay in the matrix. So, you know, you know, it's funny because people think about sabbaticals all weird ways. Like you are retired or John Hunter doesn't have energy anymore. Or anybody doesn't want to go kick ass. And it couldn't be further from the truth. I will be a nuclear energy you know, reactor like Steve and yourself until the day I die. Just making the biggest impact on a community that I care about. 
And some of it is in my family. Some of it is in CROs. I'm doing coaching right now. I love giving wisdom and knowledge and best practices to current CROs or VPs of sales who listen to the podcast and will often say things to me like, your voice is authentic. You speak in a way uh -huh. that resonates uh -huh. with me. Because one, I've been there and done that. I have the scar tissue. I have the bald head from it. You know, I used to have a full head of hair. <laughs> I used to have, uh, you know, a wide variety of hobbies. But I've been in those trenches. I've had to get results in a world. And then I decided to go, I'm going to develop getting those results through people, through positivity, through values, through culture. And that, to me, is a missing ingredient, especially in enterprise software where we just want to skip the steps. We want to take the shortcuts. <coughs> want the results. That. Couldn't okay. avoid that one. We want, quote, results without all of this other work. And I just think it's a missing significant um, ingredient in enterprise software leadership. And it's one I'm okay. really um, like to I do as an operator. And I love to coach, advise, and speak to as a, as a person who's been there and done that. So there's a lot of Eastern philosophy that I'm hearing from you. Beginner's mind, non-attachment, and surrender are three things that I've studied from Eastern philosophy that I'm hearing loud and clear through you right now. So let's explore. So surrendering. I was going to say, surrender is the perfect word. It's a better word than letting go. Because letting go isn't necessarily a mental thing it could just be your hands are tired right surrendering is a is a willful act exactly it, yes it is an act of courage right to stop trying to control everything yeah and if i could just if i could just have another tangent because i just saw something so you're taught so much you know i have filled my head since I was a young man, right? I was a missionary kid. I didn't, my parents were poor. I had no idea. I'm not saying that to get people feel bad for me or anything. I'm saying that because that's what drove me. What drove me was my parents didn't have squat. I was made fun of as a kid. I was going to be successful regardless. And no matter how many people told me I wasn't, just watch me. Stick my chin out. Remember Kobe Bryant in the NBA finals? He just stuck his chin out and he just willed it to be. That's how I lived. I live from that place of like, I'm willing it to happen. Surrender for, for someone who's willed his entire life. That it, surrender? That's a word that like, I, it wasn't even in my vocabulary. Right. We'll never surrender was my mindset. But what I realized is that the, what I was able to, 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 to see, which is, again, it's ugly, right? Anytime you see something about yourself, it's ugly. It's great. You're grateful for it, but it's ugly. I realized that on one hand, I was telling people this philosophy. But on the other hand, I wasn't really living it. Right? I knew it. I knew how to articulate it. I knew, And I believed it, but I didn't see it in me. The only way that I got to this place was I was in a situation. For the, for the first time in my professional career, I realized I couldn't sustain what I was doing. And things were outside of my control. And I had to make a decision on what I was going to do. And so I decided to surrender. And it was that surrender that made it possible for me to basically tear down my organization and rebuild it. Because every, every brick I, I threw off, every plank I removed, it, it hurt. <laughs> and why did it hurt? Why was it painful? It hurt because I believed that my identity was tied up in oh. the success of my of my company. Like for me, there was very little gap, if any, between Kaiser and me. Well, I, I think you know, golf golf in itself, just playing the game is gonna teach you all you need to learn about life. Period. Oh, that's so great. I love that. <laughs> It's just That's awesome. It's just that yeah. simple to me. Simple as that. Um, it's going to teach you wow. uh, how to interact with people. Um, how to um, how how are you going to deal with your adversities? How are you going to deal with when you get in trouble? And how mm. uh, I, I always make the you know the analogy that I could hit my best drive ever. You know, being the big hitter I am, 
300 yards down the middle and, and best drive I've ever hit in my life. And it rolls into a divot and okay. I have a couple ways to deal with it. I can stand there and cry and feel sorry for myself and moan and groan and make all sorts of antics, or I can look at it as an opportunity and say, wow, watch this, watch me. Cause I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. And I can figure out a way. And when you look at the really great players, even Tiger, at, you know, at uh, the British Open, at the yeah, Open last yeah, week, you yeah. know, he drives it first hole into a divot. He didn't stand there and moan and groan. He looks at that as an opportunity. Um, and he wasn't happy with the results, but he didn't, you know, sit there and feel sorry for himself. Um, uh, so, and I think it's how you deal with people, how you deal with yourself, how you, because it isn't a game you're going to win every day. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah, like how many shots go as planned? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Was it Hogan that said he hit two? Is yeah, right. Around. Yeah. He uh, was happy. <laughs> yeah. I'd say a maximum of 18 go exactly as you wanted. Those are the ones, the putts that go in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be true. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I just think the game really in itself, and I know we like to put all the words, the first tees put a lot of words to it and and the integrity and the honesty and, you know, uh, but it just in itself and they, and they put the words to the game. Um, It will teach you exactly what you need to learn in life. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, I mean, you are a healer. Do you, do you acknowledge that or no? I think I can acknowledge that. <laughs> yeah. In the industry, bro, I mean, right? I mean, right? You're helping yeah. people heal, heal from hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that psychedelics should be fundamentally a part of uh, treatment? Definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt. Okay. Um, I, I, th- I think it's, I, I have a hard time with, you know, the whole idea of governmental regulation. I think once once we get regulatory bodies involved, things can really, you know, the waters get muddied. Um, I don't believe that there's a great benefit to just having these substances just available to everybody in whatever way they want to. But my libertarian sensibilities, it's like, yeah, okay, well, if you want to just, you know, mess yourself up on that i guess that's your right to do that um but i do believe very strongly that there's incredible healing properties um of these substances i mean they really um i've i've done a lot of different legitimate psychedelic therapies uh in my own recovery um from addiction i i had a a very very significant addiction to opiates for many years that resulted you know kind of came about from some pain treatments and you know um getting getting prescribed opiates for pain is um i even remember there was a, a time when a doctor had told me this was back in early early 2000s and i initially was was using just vicodin And he had warned me about it and said, man, it's a slippery slope. You're always going to need more. And eventually all of it won't be enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, you know, yes, opiates are very effective in treating pain, but eventually your body adjusts and you can't take enough, you know, to to treat the pain and eventually get to a point where, you know, where I eventually got myself was I wasn't taking the drugs to feel good anymore. I was taking them not to feel bad. And so um, it's when we look at like, okay, well, that's our standard treatment for pain at this point. That's kind of the, you know, the, the, the top of the chart there in being able to deal with pain, but long-term. You're talking physical pain now. Physical pain. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually it gets to emotional pain. I think that really for myself, it was the the intersection of my treatment of my physical pain and then going through um, a divorce and, you know, the disillusion of my family and, you know, all of that, that it, it was that intersection really kind of tipped me over to the point of, okay, I'm not just taking this now for my physical pain. I'm recognizing that when I take this for physical pain, I don't really care so much about all the emotional pain. A cool definition of mantra that I got from one of my most influential teachers and dearest of friends, Dr. Allison Arnold or Doc Alley, two-time former guest on uh, Tough Talks here. 
Uh, she taught me that the, the mantra, another cool definition of mantra is um, protector of the mind. How good is that? How good is that? Way to go, Doc Alley. <laughs> oh. Protector of the mind. So perfect, right? Because, right? Because when, as we're, we're conditioned to experience reality so problematically, so much, right? So often. That's, uh, that's a, a misuse of the mind. Right? Like one of the mantras is, wary is a misuse of imagination. I don't know if we credit Steve Chandler for that or Buddha. Probably the same thing. <laughs> the godfather of coaching, Steve Chandler. But yeah, protector of the mind. These mantras, that's what they do. They serve to protect, help me protect myself by using my mind in a skillful way. 